to welcome our guests tonight. It's always uh, wonderful when we have newcomers and people who found out. And we have Lewis in the back and Alex. And Alex. And Alex. <laughs> Lewis comes from Resin and Alex is from Ashburn and they found out about us and they're here. So welcome. We hope that you find in our fellowship something that you're looking for. And uh, our speaker tonight is Father Brian Krastic. Father was born in Anchorage, Alaska on Elmendorf Air Force Base. And, uh, he got the typical <laughs> Catholic formation of his time, which is to say, almost none. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then his first meaningful experience with the church occurred at the University of Virginia, where he also met the Order of Preachers. After graduating, he was confirmed at the age of 23. And returned to the VA, began attending daily mass, and then working as an actuary and statistician, he entered the Dominican province of St. Joseph in 1985, and was ordained in 1992, so 31 years. <coughs> and thank you. His first assignment was to teach philosophy at Providence College. From there, he enrolled at Loyola University of Chicago, earning a PhD on Kant's transcendental account of empirical cognition which is not tonight's topic. Uh, and he did that in 2003. He's been on the faculty of the Dominican House of Studies since 2002, where he's taught subjects concerning the history of philosophy, various topical courses, logic, epistemology, metaphysics, etc., as areas of research that focus on its permissive response to the various claims that have arisen in modernity. I suppose he's going to talk to us a little bit about foundationalism and post-foundationalism and why Thomas has got the better answer anyway, and did before those questions even arose. Yeah. But today, he's speaking to us on the nature of the good and what are the virtue of ethics anyway. So please join me in welcoming Father Brian. Yes. Okay, yeah. Exactly right. Okay. Very good. Right. Thank you. I'll begin with prayer and under the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father, we ask that you quicken your spirit within us, that we may ever be attentive to the stirrings of your grace in all that we say and all that we do, that we may continue to follow ever more closely after your son. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 So uh, my name, I didn't, I gave you a handout, and there's about four pages that are on the back there if you didn't get one. Um, did everybody get one? Did everybody want one? Well, I don't care if you want one. You should have one. <laughs> uh, so I didn't put my I put my name on the last page. If you're looking how to spell it, so it's it's actually it's Polish and now it's Polskek. And I just learned this past couple weeks ago that father I thought a father was Wojciech, but actually it's Polsk. So it's Schwanz Schwanzek. So okay, so that's um, yeah, so that's my name. Um, the topic. Uh, was introduced to me had to do with trans good as the transcendental, which is a very unusual topic. And so if this gets hard to follow, it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have a so I didn't know I'd have a, I'd have an erase board, but I do. So hopefully that's that's going to help me. But my handwriting, yeah, the only thing I have in common with Thomas Aquinas is an illegible handwriting, and that's what I chat with here. But it's helpful, I think, to kind of draw things. Um, yeah, so I think ba the basic, um, so I'm going to get to the transcendental good, but I, I feel like I have to talk about a good number of things before I get to that, because that's a fairly abstract possibility. So uh, what I want to do is sort of base my discussion on a, on, a, on a basic point of contrast between Aristotle and Plato. Plato, I like to, so basically if you just sort of, just gr briefly glance at the first page, which is a platonic ladder, and I, if maybe you prefer, maybe you've heard of the divided line in the cave, so that's, uh, so hopefully I'm, some of you have had that, and at least if you haven't, well, tough, I'm gonna have to go to the <laughs> uh, And then, so by contrast, I wanna say that Aristotle and, and, and Aquinas have more of a scaffolding. And the point of that is, for Plato, if you've ever seen the uh, School of Athens, the, in the center of it, there's all the ancient, ancient philosophers, in the center of it, there's Aristotle and Plato, and, and er, Plato is pointing up, meaning that's where the forms are. And that's so for basically Plato, this is kind of my basic understanding of this. One way I describe this is so you have a form, the form of man, we'll say. Now, what do I mean by the form? It's depicted, first place, it's not supposed to be depicted, it's immaterial. But for, for, for purposes of, of, of elucidation, think of the form as a perfectly formed individual. That's the form. 
the individuals which participate in this, they're copies, but they're sort of copies of something that's sort of over and above everything else. It's an immaterial reality. So the individuals are all incomplete in some in kind of a drastic way. This one's missing a head, this one's missing the legs, and this one's missing the arms. But I mean, that's the point of it. So the, everything about the, the individual is understood relative to a higher reality, more abstract and more spiritual reality, and that's the form. And while I'm at it, I should probably note, um, so that's, so, So the point, we're, we're just supposed to be discussing the transcendentals as opposed to the transcendent. Plato's approach is everything is vertical. In the early life of the church, particularly someone like Augustine, you see this. Um, oh, I did write that down. There, is, there are various kind of key passages, say, in St. Paul, where he talks about the flesh and the spirit, the body and the soul. So because of that, of, of the two ancient philosophers that they had access to, Plato was the more readily acceptable. And then, because Aristotle makes everything, Aristotle says the soul dies with the body, that the, that the world is eternal, and that God doesn't know individuals. So right there, it's sort of Aristotle was sort of pushed to the side early on. The early church fathers, to the extent that they're philosophical, some of them weren't, like Tertullian, what does Athens do with Jerusalem? Um, they were, uh, so they sort of embraced or somehow made use of, of Plato. They sort of baptized Plato, I guess. Augustine is said to have lap, baptized Plato in the way that Aquinas is said to have baptized Aristotle. But that's, so the basic contrast you have with Plato has this vertical dimension. So if you want to know what something is, you refer to it to its form. Its form. So to know what something is, this is what it is because it is what it isn't, I want to say. <laughs> This is a human being, not because it's human being in itself, but because it, it participates in something that is not it. So in that sense, it's a kind of, there's a vertical version of this. So, so for Plato, uh, which I'll get to in a minute, just as a preview, I cite the divided line. You can think of that as the ladder, the, or the, the cave, how you sort of start with, with physical experience and you work your way up and eventually you attain the forms. Once you attain the forms, to borrow a phrase from, from uh, Wittgenstein, you can kick away the ladder. I've attained the truth. I don't need to worry about these. So Plato has kind of a, a ladder with this, whereas I think that Aristotle, and this is another side of it, uh, for just, I guess that's the second picture. Aristotle approaches things by sort of, uh, the, the, the Aristotle school were called the peripatetics, meaning they sort of walked around as they had their discussions. But I think it also sort of describes an Aristotelian approach to things. If you want to know what something is, you have to engage the physical thing itself. And so you have these basic principles, metaphysical principles like uh, being and essence, accidents and substance, matter and form, potency and act. That's the kind of vocabulary, it's what I call along the, the, the axis of depth. So you're a way to kind of approach the thing by these principles. Some things for like humans have a, what we call a second potency. A second potency is for humans to be something like, once I, first place I have the first potency to learn a language or a discipline like mathematics or geometry. So I have that potency, and then I've, I've actualized it. I've learned the discipline. But then there's a second potency when I'm actually thinking in those terms. So potency and act, it kind of applies in different ways, and that's one of the ways you understand what you, whereas, so that's how you would differentiate humans from, say, animals. They just have knowledge. They don't have disciplines. Maybe you can kind of tra train them into having habits, or they're just being trained. But they're not really sort of actualizing it themselves. So the point is, so for for, Plato, for Aristotle, there's like there's there's the, there's the axis of depth what you're approaching. So this is like uh, okay, let's see here. Uh, what do I want to talk? I guess dog. So there's the axis of depth by which we at least principles by which you articulate what dog is, or maybe it's a horse. <laughs> you know, it's a unicorn. <laughs> um, but so you have the axis of depth, which gives you sort of metaphysical principle. And, and by metaphysical, they they articulate what something is. Um, they're in respect to the physical, but they're not always physical themselves. Whereas so when you think of metaphysics, I think most people tend to think of it in terms of Platonic sense. The metaphysical is what's beyond the physical. And for Aristotle, it's not really beyond the physical. It's the principles by which you articulate what something is in itself. That's the axis of depth. 
And then there's what I call the horizontal axis, you know, and which is a kind of, which, so the vertical axis is the depth, so this is the horizontal. How do I write this top of my mind? See, I write that out and you can't even tell what it says, so that's <laughs> <laughs> But I can move it around, so maybe it's even closer. Anyway, uh, so there's, so when you say it's like what, what human beings are, you could talk about potency and act, form and matter, substance and accent, all of that, but the definition of man is a rational animal by which you compare what one, what you take a species human and you, can, and you kind of understood, understand it in terms of the genus, which is animal, and then you compare it with others, so there's a specific difference. So this is part of the, so for Aristotle, I think there's this kind of, you walk around something, you're not building a ladder to kind of see it from above, you're sort of developing these principles, these sort of methodology by which you make these, you sort of walk around the thing, you see what it does in itself, you would compare what it does with what other things that are like it or not like it. And then what I want to say is that the, the vertical axis of that scaffolding, which I think is what, what, Aris, what Aquinas introduces, there's the way in which you could talk about, you know, how you could talk about, say, animals or, or plants or animals or human beings or angels or God. Those principles kind of apply at each level but they do in a kind of analogical way. So for example, when you're talking about potency and act, animals have first potency, humans have first and second potency, whereas I think angels would just have second potency. They have all, they're given these ideas, they're given infused ideas by God, and they either think of them or they don't. They don't have to acquire them. So you can say these principles kind of apply differently on different levels, whereas God, there's no potency in God. God is pure act. So these principles, I think, also Aquinas starts to articulate, they have a kind of vertical application and they adjust. It's not, you can't use the same scale to talk about everything. When you're talking about God, obviously it's different from creatures. Okay, so that's kind of the overview of this. Um, okay, so to talk about Plato, uh, let's see. There's a whole business about, um, um, okay. Okay, so maybe I'll just refer to that first handout then. So Plato, um, basically, I, I'll talk about the allegory of the cave. Um, that's, um, so that I've got a double line, so he's got the divided line, which is sort of a geometric presentation of these different levels of knowing. And then you have, a, um, I guess, a sort of storied appreciation of that. And the allegory of the cave, I think, so they all depict the same, so there are these, there's two levels, there's the physical, which is of the individual. So you have the sensible realm, which is the realm of opinion, and that deals with individual physical things. And then above that, you have the intelligible realm, which is of the forms. And then over and above that, you have the form of the good. So, be, so he'll talk about, Plato will say things like, the form of the good is beyond being, which for, Ari, for Aristotelian doesn't make any sense. Things either are or not. How can you have something that's beyond being? For Plato, the form being is, is basically intelligibility. Something has being, the forms have being. The individuals come and go. They don't they have they live in the realm of becoming. So individual things, so any one of these individual human beings comes into being with its own imperfections and then it passes away. This thing remains forever. So this is a this has being, and this has this is the coming to be. And then you have over and above all that. So the forms are the basis of intelligibility. For Plato, if you want to know what human beings are, you don't sort of, as Aristotle would recommend, you wander around gathering experiences from different individuals and you're kind of collating that information and comparing and contrasting it. You're understanding with respect to the transcendent basis of that, and that's the form. And then the form of the good, Uh, well, uh, intelligibility relative to the, so the forms are the basis of intelligibility relative to the individual things. The sun, or the form of the good, is the basis of intelligibility of the forms. So this, these, I say, come to be, or pass away, 
The, for, the forms have being, come to be, pass away. The forms have being, and the sun or the form of the good is beyond being. <coughs> Um, okay. Okay. So, so for Plato, one the, the basic transcendentals, which I'll say why I get those in a minute, it, the, the the transcendentals, um, one true and good are articulations that most apply and uniquely and properly apply to the form of the good. So something is one. Individuals, he's going to say, aren't, aren't, individuals aren't really, don't really have the kind of unity that they're supposed to. They come to be, they pass away. As they do so, they have different deformities that maybe get healed or broken or, or pure or here, cured, etc. So individuals don't, and plus there's a, there's a multiplicity of individuals. So the individuals don't really have a true unity. They have maybe a kind of temporary unity. The real form of so force, of, a higher source of unity, is the form, because everything is what it is because it participates in that form. So the source of unity of oneness is the form. But over and above that, there's the form of the good. Now, why does the form of the good have a higher unity than the forms? In what sense do we say that? How many forms are there? A lot. How many, how, how, what's yeah. the form of the good? One. That's like there's one sun, and the sun illuminates all these forms so that they're intelligible mm -hmm. by other minds. And then those, and then, the, and then he has this whole story about the demiurge, or the divine craftsman, which sees the forms and instantiates them in matter. And so that's, and, be, and, be, and he only does, or it only does that because the form of the good makes these forms intelligible. So oneness is something that's. So basically, again, what I'm getting at is here for Plato, the transcendentals, what, what Aristotle, what Aquinas refers to as the transcendentals, all belong to the transcendent. One belongs to the form of the good. Uh, the true is also, so the, you can see how the individuals are not really true because they're deformed versions of what they should be. The, forms, the, the, the form they participate is really the truth, but they themselves are only true in a true sense, or actualized truth, I guess, because they're illumined by the form of the good. Question so far? What do we think completely? Uh, these, in, um, what's incomplete? The participating in Oh, the, yeah, these are always incomplete. Right. Um, yeah. OK. Yeah, and again, so I, I know that something, yeah, and that's kind of his big, sorry, early on in the early dialogues, he wants to say, well, how do I know somebody is a something? Because anybody I look at has always got these imperfections. How can I know that? Well, because he has this whole story about recollection. There was a time when the soul, before it was united to the body, saw the form. And the physical things are just reminders of that. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah. Where does he, does he ever really describe the form of the good? Because he avoids no. that in the Republic, right? So the, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, no, it makes a very, yeah. You think it's, it's like, it's the showcase of his philosophy. This is where he's going to deliver it. Nope, just the. But I think a key reason for that, he'll come, and like in the seventh letter, there's a famous passage about, I've never actually written anything at the fullness of what I believe. And I think the part of that is because words are, words are like deeds. Words are like, they're incomplete, they're, uh, they're, they're equivocal, they equivocate, they're, they're misunderstood, they're misspoken. So really, what you have to see it for yourself. So I think that's the big thing about Plato. It's like his dialogues are often, the theme of the dialogue is what is justice or what is love? He, doesn't, he never sits down and says, this is it. Because no, you're supposed to, so I think the dialogues themselves are means of engaging. I call them kind of mathematicals. Meaning they're conceptual devices by which we understand something of the higher realm, mainly the form. Mm -hmm. So the dialogues are sort of half answers and you kind of, as you, if you're really interested, You'll sit down and, and, and work through them probably for the rest of your life, and then you'll come to the truth by that way. There's a famous passage in the Mino. Where he's teaching he's teaching the slave boy about you know trying to square the I guess double the square, and I mean everybody says well he shows him, but I think a fair question to ask is does the kid really care or is it just because he's got this pesky guy who keeps asking him you know think of a an overzealous geometry teacher with a slacker who just like whatever. 
So eventually, just kind of <laughs> most of his questions, he's uh huh, yeah, I guess so. If you see. so, it's like because you don't the answer's there for the for the kid and for us, but we have to kind of read more than just what's on the page. It's kind of you have to read through that. So I think his his dialogues are kind of designed that way. They're sort of they're leading you to the truth, but not giving you the truth because he doesn't want to be. He's not indoctrinating people. He's training them to think for themselves, and I think that's part of it. Or to see the, the ultimate realities. It's not that. It's not like you're making it up, but you have to have the discipline for it and the genuine interest. And if I just tell you, you know, you won't ask any more questions because you tell you, oh, the, the, that's, is that going to be on the exam? Okay, I don't know it. Then I can forget <laughs> that. Okay. Um, okay, so then the good, well, it's, I mean, the source of all goodness is the form of the good. That's why it's named that. So the transcendentals, for Plato are basically in the transcendent. And in a certain sense, early Christian thinkers, I think in a lot of ways kind of mimic that. Everything is to be, under these, these sort of uh, highest understandings of things are, are to be appreciated most properly in God. Is anything that's good that's not from God? God is the source of goodness. God is the source of truth. So for, so for Plato, he'll say the truth so Aristotle say truth is a correspondence. When my, my mind conforms to what's given to it, then it attains the truth. If it does it in a proper, proper way. But for Plato, it's the form itself. That's the truth. These things are never going to be true. So you can, that's, you can have the form without the individuals, but you can't have the individuals without the form. So that's the source of truth. In it. So it's, this is one true and good, and, it, and, that's, and, then, and as is God. So I think that's the early that's the early view of this the early Christian understanding of this. Um, anything else I want to say? Yeah. So the form of the good is be, is before is beyond being. Okay. All right. So why did Aristotle disagree with him? Um, because we live in this world. Well, One's the student of the other. He obviously had a disagreement with his professor. Sure. Yeah, I mean, because he thinks we live in this world, and the whole business about recollection is a little bit is a little questionable. And then the other thing is, I think the other thing is, well, what does the cart and the horse, or chicken and the egg, I suppose? But Aristotle was also a student. Well, uh, uh, So for him, I mean, it's now that, you know, some have said that basically the human mind seems to either divide into sort of the theoretical approach to things or the, practical, or the sort of empirical. And so that's, you know, yeah. So I mean, it's like, if you're going to understand what something is, you have to kind of investigate. You have to, you have to walk around it or let it sort of move around and it has to manifest itself. You can't, you don't know what a tree is just by looking at it one time. You have to understand well, it, it, in, the, in, the, in a couple of weeks, I guess, they'll start losing their leaves, but that doesn't mean they're dying, although sometimes it does, et cetera. So you kind of have to go through these different sort of manifestations of something. Okay. Um, right, so in that, um, yeah, in, in that uh, school of Athens, Plato is pointing up, Aristotle is, this is the interesting thing, what, <laughs> his hand is like this, and some have said, is it, <laughs> Because in a certain sense, he uses analogy a lot. He uses these basic comparisons of one thing with another. And so if things are not sort of the precision that you get with mathematics, you have to make these comparisons. But also, some have suggested it's almost like he's playing a piano, which I kind of like because I think he uses various distinctions and he kind of wheels them into place almost in an artistic way. It's like, does this, which distinction do I have to appeal to at this point? And so there's a kind of moving around back and forth. There's the axis of depth. There's the axis of, 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 of breadth, et cetera. There's these different. Um, so a being is what it is. So you have beings, which are entities, and they divide by these different distinctions. You have essence and existence. So, that, so the essence itself is a substance and accidents. The substance is matter and form. Then there's potency and act, which you use to articulate all of those things. So there's this kind of. Um, Stacking of distinctions, and you appeal to one or the other based on different ways. And then, as I say, there's the so these are the um, 
this is the axis of depth, and then the horizontal <coughs> axis um, is also known as the predicables. Genus, species, difference, uh, uh, accidents, and, and um, properties. Um, So, I mean, part of the, as I say, part of the early church's understanding, um, oh, there it is. If you're thinking, I mean, Galatians, I don't have the passages in front of me. Galatians 5, 17, 1 Corinthians 9, 27. Those are sort of passages where Paul talks about, he sort of has this antithesis between the body and the soul, the spirit and the, uh, the, spirit and the, and the corporeal, etc. So there's the way in which, uh, there's this bifurcation that you see in, in St. Paul that sort of recommends what this is. With Aquinas, um, I suppose there's something to be said about the time in which he came along. He came along in the 13th century. One of his uh, almost contemporaries would have been someone like St. Francis. You can think about Brother, Son, Sister, Moon. Sort of it's a celebration of the of creation of God. And there's a kind of manifold wonder that all these things are all from God. And so there's a way beyond the sort of the delight we take in our senses to know what things are, which is what you get with Aristotle, Aquinas sort of baptizes that and thinks about to know what things are, and they have an integrity of their own. I mean, you can appreciate that by your, by your own physical and intellectual appreciation of things, which we get from Aristotle, but there's also, there's this vertical axis you can add on to that, by which you can appreciate things as designed by God. So not only is there the wonder, say, I don't know, you can talk about frogs, which have this interesting development. They go through tadpoles and things that don't, I guess, they have gills at certain points, right? Mm -hmm. And then that point they have, it's, it's, so there must be a point where they have gills, and then they have gills and lungs, and then they just get lungs. So there's it'd be just that. And then you can think about how they fit into their own environment, and this is all part of God's plan. So there's a sort of book of nature, which is itself part of God's, one of God's books. So I think that's part of, Aquinas' appropriation of Aristotle is that you have a, it's, uh, the, the world is not as something we need to flee from. There's a, there's a greater optimism about the created order. Um, right, okay. Okay, so right, uh, so that's, that brings me to my second handout, the Aristotelian scaffolding. So as I say, you have uh, God, angels, so there's the vertical axis, which are these, these levels of, of, of um, what? Increasingly um, spiritual entities, I guess. The bottom, you have something like minerals or artifacts. So there you could talk about, uh, did I put that on there? So it's like for minerals or artifacts, the form and the matter, I mean, Aristotle introduces these distinctions, form, matter, formal cause, matter cause, material cause, efficient, et cetera. Form and matter, when you're talking about an artifact, it's very simple. The, mat the form is just the shape. The matter is what it's made out of, the form, um, the shape. Now, when you get to something that's moving or, li or gr living, it's going to be changing. So even a plant, you can't really talk about the shape anymore. It's what's the principle that causes the dynamism of that shape. And then it's all the form there for living things. So it's like, you know, so when you're talking about artifacts, form is just the shape of it. Above that, the form is the soul the principle of dynamism by which it goes through these different phases, in which it does different things for different reasons in different ways. Um, okay, so then you have uh, brutes. Uh, the point of that is, is humans, so animal is a kind of genus, I guess. So I'm supposed to call them brutes, not just animals, there were animals as well. So brutes have, say, there's a, there's a greater potency because they have movement. So there's that's another sense. There's another sort of, uh, change in which, so as, you, as you're working way up that. And then humans, let's see, what else do I want to say about this? Uh, I've already said something about, so there's like, everything has potency. So, you know, plants have a potency in terms of where they're located, et cetera, all the different accidents that they have. Brutes have another potency in the sense they can be in different places and still be the same thing. And then humans have a potency which is of acquiring knowledge which is a different thing from what animals have. Um, and well, for animals, uh, animals have a kind of instinct, whereas humans have a, um, well, I guess I want to say that, this is going to take me a while to understand. Humans have free will. Animals have, I don't want to, I want to say, I thought, so I, the way I'm going to articulate this is I think that animals have 
uh, they select options. I mean, they're hungry, they eat. What are they gonna eat, what are their options? They just pick one of those things. Well, humans do that. But humans also think, and ask questions like, well, what do I wanna be when I grow up? Well, who do I wanna marry? Or how, you know, what, what, what uh, those kinds of decisions. So we have a free will in that sense. We can pick, our potency is more sort of uh, sophisticated than that. And then, um, but it's, there's still an actuality in terms of our physicality. Angels, um, okay, what did I say about angels? Um, as I said, they have a kind of second potency, meaning they don't go through the, the, the business about acquiring knowledge, that's just infused into them. So there's a way in which they acquire their, their gifts. So the, the potency is they either entertain one idea versus another. So in that sense, they're not pure potency, or they're not pure act, God is pure act. So that's one way of preserving the difference between, between the two. And then God, um, okay, th I've also sort of mentioned the way these, say, the principles of, of, of depth sort of change as you go up the, 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 adder, the ladder. Um, also, so does, so does the horizontal axis. And the interesting way that that applies is that for angels, um, for, for anything below angels, you have individuals within a species, as I have on this thing here. For angels, each individual is its own species. So these applications sort of change as you go up the ladder. So that's the role of, of analog analogy, is that these same distinctions apply, but they apply in a kind of different way as you proceed. Um, right, and then, and then you have, a, so, okay, yeah. So, so for all created beings, you have this distinction between essence and existence, whereas in God, that collapses. God is his own being. And that's what differentiates um, God from, from everything else. Um, Bonaventure was a contemporary of Aquinas, and he was kind of appropriating certain amounts of, of, of Aristotle. And what he wanted to say is that everything is, what, what makes the distinction between God and everything else for Bonaventure is that God is pure form. And Aquinas says, no, form, and, so angels are pure form. God is pure being. So there's a way in which he kind of, uh, there's different ways of appropriating or baptizing Aristotle. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, so why don't I go through all of that? Well, all right, so there's, on the third handout, there's uh, Aquinas' derivation of the transcendental. So you have, so basically it's every being or ends, is it, is, has being in itself or being in relation to something else, and that's the first distinction. Something with respect to itself is affirmative, that is, it's a thing, or it's negative, it's undivided, meaning it's one. Okay, so then there's the in relation to other things. So as, it, as distinct from other things, it's a something. So everything is a, is a, is a thing, it's one, and it's also a something. It's meaning it's this thingness versus that thingness. And then you have, and real in conformity with the soul, as with respect to the intellect, it's true and also good. So these, these uh, transcendentals are not transcendent, meaning the transcendent, I think, is applying to the highest order. These transcend transcendentals apply to everything. The other th the thing I want to point out is, well, that's what these are. These apply to everything as well. So what's the difference? So that you have these, these distinctions apply to every, even God. I mean, they, they apply in a different way. So now you're introducing these transcendentals. Uh, so that's, so I have my scaffolding. Um, I have three dimensions there, but um, I'm, maybe I'm supposed to have a fourth, <laughs> the transcendentals to fit that on here. So I think, um, so what exactly are the transcendentals? I think as compared to the other characterizations of, of, of being or metaphysics, I think they're ways of treating entities or beings sort of um, in a kind of exterior way. The, the axis of depth gives you the interior principle, potency act, form and matter, essence and existence, etc. These refer to things as things in themselves. And so the, the axis of depth gives you kind of the, the guts of the, the metaphysical guts of any entity. Whereas I think the transcendentals locate one entity relative to it. So you have the entity in itself, it's a thing, and thing often means it has a, it's, an, it's an entity, it has, a, it has its own nature or essence. And then it's also a one, so that pertains what it is in itself, and then you can start comparing it to other things. 
other, um, other, other things, meaning some things, are then also true and good. Okay. So those are with respect to the, the bottom two are with respect to the soul. All right. So that's, one, that's the other thing. He's got at least two derivations of the transcendentals. The second one um, is given later. They're all come, they both come, come from the De Veritate, a series of disputed questions on truth. The second one comes from question 21. And there he says, by additions to being, and that's where he just gives you the one true and the good. So the question, I think mean, in some respects, that's the sort of that's the sort of classical understanding of what the transcendentals are. But I think he's careful to go through the first the first derivation, which includes uh, uh, thing, thing and something. And you think, well, what that's not. But I think that he does that to kind of emphasize this is all about individual beings. All of this, even though it has a kind of uh, broadness to it it's still rooted in the physical and the differentiation between things of the physical order. And then it well, also applies to, to angelic things as well. Okay. Um, yeah, so they're transcendent as opposed to, uh, they're transcendental as opposed to transcendent. Okay. Um, questions so far? Too much? Yeah. No, I'm just trying to uh, summarize this a little. So. So um, Aristotle's kind of laying the foundation of just looking at things from just okay. observation, right? And then for Plato... Well, it's also speculation. Speculation, but, okay, yeah. Right. But for Plato, it was like, that wasn't good enough because Aristotle was only talking about variations on a, on a, on a truth or a, or, or a form, like, you're, like Plato was trying to... There has to be something. If there's so many variations, there has to be a... Single form or, or pure yeah. form. Is that, am I saying yeah. that right? Yeah. But I guess so. This is sort of follows on the sort of pre Socratic discussions about what makes something be what it is. Yeah. And so you had Thales said water, and you had uh, Anaximander says it's an indefinite, and Anaximenes, et cetera. Pythagoreans say it's matter or it's form. Um, so for Plato, it's, it's a transcendent form. Yeah. But I think Aristotle's complaint with that is but the world is a lot more complicated than that. And it deserves, it, it warrants its own investigation. It has an integrity. And Plato is sort of absenting himself from that by, I mean, not to say that Plato's philosophy is <coughs> sort of, uh, under, underdeveloped or anything, but it, it lacks a proper orientation of how we understand ourselves. And also, he's going to say for Plato, uh, my true nature isn't this existence, it's the spiritual existence I had before I was united with the body. And Aristotle's like, well, Maybe, but <laughs> I don't have access to that right now. So what do we? What do I, How about where I'm living here and now? So is that why Aquinas aligned more with Aristotle over Plato? Or? I well, Father, I don't, I don't think you <coughs> spoken up about um, the substance and, and contrasting substance with with Plato's form. Well, the substance is what underlies the. It's part of the essence that underlies the accidents. But isn't substance the bringing together of form and matter? Well, yeah, form and matter are, you know, so I mean, so I mean, one, the simplistic temptation is to say the form, the substance is the form, but it's it's not just my soul, it's my soul related to my body. So right. there's that fundamental um, interaction of the two, that's the substance. So, yeah, but to back to your question, but, um, So yeah, I mean, sort of in a, in a, in a Christian sense. Plato, I mean, from a Christian perspective, I think Plato's approach is how do I understand myself relative to 
the beyond. Whereas I think Aristotle says, but okay, maybe. But that, I mean, that's part of that the scaffolding is that, uh, so Aquinas adds that sort of vertical dimension to this. So it's how I understand my place relative to God, um, in terms, or even the, with respect to the angels. So often when Aquinas is talking about things, he often makes these comparisons, like human knowledge is this, as opposed to an, uh, angelic knowledge, as opposed to an, animal-like knowledge. And that helps us understand who we are by way of these contrasts. So I think Aristotle is this is sort of this discursivity of, of his approach. It's always this kind of moving around, like how do I think about it in these terms? How do I think about it in those terms? One of my favorite passages for Aquinas is to say, you'll never know the essence of a fly. You think, well, it's a pretty simple, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a bug, what's the big deal? But I think for him it's like, well, because uh, we acquire knowledge in terms of our sort of incidental engagements, I don't see the essence of the fly. I'm sort of interpolating it based on what I do see of its accidents and its substance, its form and its matter. I'm, I'm, I, you know, and every day we learn something more about flies. Um, um, yeah, so I think, whereas he'd say, whereas angelic knowledge does see, does comprehend the essence of a fly. Um, part of it is because our knowledge is gotten by way of experience. Nothing, for Aristotle, nothing's in the mind that's not first in the senses. So it's as I engage with these things, I start to build up this knowledge of things. So we have concepts that are called from our own experience. Angels have infused ideas, and they're both of the same thing. The angels ideas are about the essences of things as are our concepts, but they're gotten at by different ways. When they're gotten, so it's like the, the angels have a kind of God's eye view of, 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 of any created thing, whereas humans have a bottom-up view. We're kind of piecing it together. And part of, part of what the, the value of, approach, of, 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 of Aquinas' approach is the kind of it says, well, this is your place. And you know, what was that? They used to have those big posters and there would be a, a, a universe or something and they'd say, you are here. Well, the, 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 his scaffolding, I think, is also that. If you are here, you don't, there are certain things you can't acquire. And let's be clear, that you can't do, that, why you can't acquire that. So it's, in that sense, I think it's, it's a humbler estimation. It's like, this is where you live. You're not an angel. You can talk about angels, and maybe they'll talk to you, but um, you, know, it, it's, it's, you shouldn't presume that kind of knowledge. In fact, he says, um, when he's talking about angels, he has this interesting claim that, you know, so when angels communicate with human beings, they kind of, that's just, I guess the rough way of putting it, they have to dump things down a bit. Because they, it's, and it's not like, well, if you study real hard, and if you're good at your metaphysics, you'll be at the level of an angel. No, it's just they have a different order of knowing. And so for them to communicate with us, they kind of have to revert to, uh, like, like you know, not in kitty language, but something like that. They have to kind of propose images because that's how we learn. And that's part of the reason why I'm often, I'm looking for, if I can doodle in front of you, that's, that's a metaphor, by the way. Because I think we learn by these images. And I think, because Aristotle and Aquinas both say, even our knowledge attains the level, there's kind of an abstract level of this idea, we still have to revert to a kind of image, what he calls a phantasm. I still have to have some sort of image in front of me if, if I'm able to make sense of it. And I think that's kind of the, for Aquinas, I think that that's always been a valuable lesson. And I think also in the spiritual life, there's this whole question about there's the role of the sort of, um, what is it, the kind of iconoclastic. It's like you should, divest, you should divest yourself of any kind of image because they're graven images and they're, they're going to be distracting and they're going to limit your understanding of the transcendent realm of God and the angels, etc. Aquinas sort of has a, a, a more helpful take of this because he'll sort of say, yeah, but what about the incarnation? God became man, and that's the point of it. That's how we understand him. Now, it doesn't give us a God's eye view of what the divine is, but it sure does help because he's kind of presented himself. And then he's given us the sacraments, physical means by which we live out our salvation. So this kind of engagement with the things around us, that's part of why I think he's helpful, because it's not just, just be spiritual. It's like, you know, it's like, you gotta be spiritual according to your own nature, and we ain't angels, and, you know, Despite what uh, it's a wonderful life this day describes, <laughs> just, like, just flaming rum punch. It'd be awful if you bore it. Never mind. Okay. Never mind. Um, okay. okay. Uh, how am I doing? I'm probably coming close to. Um, okay. So, uh, okay. So.
So truth, according to Aquinas, is the adequation of the thing and the intellect. It's the adequation of the thing and the intellect. In a certain sense, the world imprints itself on us. And this is a sort of radical understanding versus sort of the, the, the role of modernity. Someone like Descartes, of course, it's like, well, you see things, we kind of we project our own understanding of things. It's not the intellect, um, not the adequation of the intellect with the thing. It's not we're getting snapshots, that the world is actually sort of pressing itself upon us. So when we know what something is, we know, we genuinely know, know there's a real essence or nature in things. And this is as opposed to much of modernity, particularly in our day and age. We don't, less and less is science is uncomfortable with things are the way they are. They have their own integrity. Modern science tends to say, yeah, but we can get in there and change it. In fact, that's what science tries to do. You can, re, you can genetically reprogram something. You don't like this, what this child is gonna be. Maybe we can get in there and change it. Or maybe we can do this surgically. Or maybe we can do this socially. It's like, how can you tailor the world to your own, your own likings? The Aristotelian approach is, no, it has its own integrity, and in fact, what you know is it's impressing itself upon you. You know something of the nature. Granted, it's not a God's eye view, it's not, a, it's not complete and coherent, I mean, I mean, comprehensive, but it's still of the real thing. So the truth is what sort of um, presses itself upon us. Now, uh, just to sort of, in the interest of time, I think I should probably, um, Okay, so the transcendentals, among their saying, what they're saying is all things are one, everything is a thing, a one, something, a true, and it's good. So what he's saying there is everything is good. Now that's from the broadest possible perspective. In a certain sense, it's an object of desire. But, I mean, in the fuller sense, not everything is good for everybody all the time. We have to make all these distinctions. So that's, I mean, the business about wanting to talk about transcendental good with respect to the moral life, I think, is a bit, I mean, it's helpful in a way, but you have to add to it. And so, um, I see I'm pushing my limit of time. So I'll just jump to the last page. Okay, yeah. So this is kind of the range of possible responses, or kind of orientations. So for him, Choosing something as we ought to is not just knowing what's, what's supposed to happen. It's supposed to do so as part of our character. And so he has, I mean, he has this, sort of the realms of possible responses. There's the bestial, which I haven't talked about, and the saintly. Aristotle mostly talks about the vicious. As someone who says that pleasurable, pleasurable adultery is to be pursued because it is a pleasure. This act is, adult, is, is, is pleasurable adultery, therefore it's something I do. And therefore you have somebody who's, I mean, there is a good, there's, there's the good of intimacy there, but it's occluded all the other elements of it. You're not, you're a social animal. What about your marriage? What about the, her marriage? What about the good of society, et cetera, et cetera? So there's a way in which there's a, there's a goodness there, but it also has to be brought in line with what we know about things, about ourselves, about human nature, about the institution of marriage, about the nature of society, et cetera. So there's that kind of a problem. So you have someone who's vicious they fall into their own desires, the goodness of things, without any kind of uh, filter. And so in that sense, it's un uninformed by knowledge. And then you have someone like the incontinent, who basically, um, he understands what this is, he understands that this is a vice and it's not something he should do. And he sees that, but he gives into it anyway, or she gives into it anyway. So there's, they give into it, but there's a kind of regret. And on the other hand, you have the sort of the continent is someone who understands that this is to be avoided, um, and he so it's, this is so he's something he does that, but there's still a struggle in what he, he or she is trying to do. And then finally, there's the, the the virtuous who understands that this is what's supposed to do and does it freely and properly and, and freely. And one of the things that comes out of this, you talked, I mentioned the critique of, of modernity. So I mean, uh, as depicted in say dramas. Virtuous are often depicted as the sort of continent. They're struggling to do the right thing. They, there's the furrowed brow, and there's the and there's the, the sweaty palms, and there's the, the, all the temptations where people are trying to prevail upon him, but he finally overcomes it. And that's kind of the Kantian view of, 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 of doing good. You do it because it's hard. Whereas Aristotle wants to say, no, it's more with keeping with your, with your, you develop a second nature. This is my nature, I understand. If, I'm a, if, if alcohol is a temptation, I just learn, 
I don't put myself in front of an alcohol, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of, of a bar, and then struggle not to drink. I understand, you just don't go there. You know, you, you have, but you have a facility of doing this with yourself. So in a certain sense, it's, this is kind of a reply to the everything is good as a transcendental, it is good, but it also has to be understood relative to our own, sort of the exigencies of our own existence. And so the transcendentals help, but the scaffolding, I think, is, is part of it as well. So that's when you talk about a first and second potency. I have the potency to be good, but there's also the second potency. And I have to make it a habit. It has to be part of my character. It has to be a kind of second nature. Okay, I think I've gone over, but I'll stop there. Questions, comments, neither one. Yeah. So I was struggling with actually defining what good is. So it's that which all he says it that which all things desire. But now see but um, now this now, to from Plato you say yeah that's what yeah that's God or the Platonic that's God, but you think well I mean tadpoles don't really do that I mean <laughs> not directly they do that by fitting into their their natural order, but I interrupt you. So. So I sort of heard it as that which we desire according to right reason. Yes, I mean that's just yeah, according to our own nature and our own circumstances, with the proper object, the proper time, and the proper way, etc. So it's so that the, the, as a transcendental saying that it's that which is to be desired or that which is desired is true in a kind of metaphysical sense, but it's not. So all these people have a desire for well, the, the good. pleasure of adultery. Pardon me? But everybody here has a desire for the pleasure of adultery. Well, I mean, but the, only at the, end the virtuous day. understands, well, there, maybe there's That's the, the pleasure of intimacy, which I have in a married state. That's the proper understanding of that. The rest of them, it's like, well, either I understand that, but I still kind of, I, I allow, maybe I allow myself to be tempted or something, or other than I, I, give, I understand that and I give into it and I feel horrible about it, but I'm probably going to do it again, you know. Or there's the, what, the, the extreme, the, the, the um, the vicious is like, well, let's, no, I got away with it, what's the problem? We're consenting adults. So is there a distinction between the, the use of the word desire and urge or temptation or? Well, I guess, yeah, so desire is a, is a natural inclination. Um, so but there's, right, there's a right understanding of that and that would be the virtuous understanding of it. But that's, this is a long, like I say, uh, the transcendentals is kind of a long way to, I mean, I didn't need to talk about all the, I could have just started with the last page, I think, in some respects. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Probably not just living the virtuous life, but living the virtuous life in a kind of in a, along the theological lines. So someone can be virtuous. That's all describable by what um, by what Aristotle has. The saintly is also is able to do all of that relative to the fact of what we've been given by faith, which sometimes isn't always clear. Like, um, well, at the end of at the end of John's Gospel. Or Peter says, well, what about him? Referring to the beloved disciple. And Jesus says, what business is that? Of? Your, your business is to follow me. And the natural question is, well, where are you going? I'll let you know. That's kind of the answer. So there's that kind of vir there's kind of saintliness, I guess. Maybe it passes through like someone like Thomas More. There's a saintliness in, in the way he lives out his, his married life. And then there's others who, you know, like, well, like, you know, celibates. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Um, to the to Aristotelian, you're part of Aristotle would say part of our final cause is, if, of animals is to produce more like yourself. That's that's I mean it's a natural part of our of who we of our constitution. But saintliness is well not all, maybe not maybe there's something else there. So I think it's over and above. It involves what's what's given by faith. It can't always be understood. Once it's achieved or once sort of begun to pursue it, it starts to make sense. But initially, it's like you got to be kidding. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. And I guess the bestial, um, I guess, I guess the other, all the everything above the bestial kind of presumes the sort of societal network. The bestial is somebody who lives outside of society, and it's like the the the, the vicious is choosing things that you find in society. The bestial is like 
just literally an animal existence, a bestial existence. Yeah, it's your fault. You picked that animal. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was uh, rigorous and instructive and helpful, and you gave us quite an amazing overview. So I'd like to thank.